Almost thank you very much, uh, Frank. It's a treat uh, to be here today. I'm, I'm not going to speak about the events of yesterday. I'm going to go to 30,000 feet and try to share with you what I think are the big trends reshaping uh, politics and geopolitics all across the world today. But I will start with a local event. On the evening of January 3rd, 2020, at around 8 p.m., a U.S. Air Force MQ-9 Reaper drone fired a laser-guided Hellfire Ninja missile at a convoy of jeeps leaving Baghdad International Airport. One of those missiles eliminated Iran's Quds Force commander Qasem Soleimani. I was on vacation in New Zealand at the time, and my editors called me and asked me to write a column about it. I told them I was far away and I needed time to think about it. Anyways, I woke up the next morning and suddenly the column just popped into my head. I wrote it on the 90-minute flight from Auckland to Queenstown, <clears throat> and I filed it from Lake Wakatupu using the hotspot off of my daughter's iPhone. Even I was surprised by the lead I wrote of that column. And my lead was Donald Trump just ordered the assassination of possibly the dumbest man in Iran and the most overrated strategist in the Middle East. Wow. Where did that come from? I did not even know myself at first, and it took me a few days to figure it out. And that is what I want to talk to you about this morning, because it came out of a very different framework for looking at both politics and geopolitics around the world. Bear with me. I'm going to take you on a whirlwind journey from Mount Olympus to Silicon Valley to Lake Urmia in Iran, and I hope by the time we're done, you will understand why I wrote that lead. Now, you will recall that in uh, Greek mythology, the titan Prometheus stole fire from a closet on Mount Olympus and delivered it to humanity uh, so it could build civilization. And I would argue that uh, over the last 600 years, there have been three giant releases of energy into the hands of men, women, and machine. The first, of course, was the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg. The second was the Industrial Revolution. And the third is the release of energy, the massive release of energy we're going through right now three nonlinear accelerations in what I call the biggest forces on the planet, the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So um, if you were to put uh, Mother Nature on a graph today, that is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth in the developing world, it looks like one giant set of accelerating hockey sticks, whether it is uh, global average temperature, whether it is incidence of extreme weather, whether it is massive population growth. Just in the last 10 years, we added a billion people and we're about to add another billion. Mother Nature is in a state of nonlinear acceleration. If you put globalization on a graph, uh, internet uses, cell phone diffusion, uh, digital global trade, put it on a graph, it looks like another set of accelerating hockey sticks. And of course, if you put Moore's Law, the law that says that the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months on a graph, it also looks like a hockey stick. We're actually in the middle of a giant release of energy, the equivalent of Gutenberg and the Industrial Revolution, as a result of three nonlinear accelerations all at the same time, with these three huge global forces. Another way to look at it is that we're actually in the middle of three climate changes at once. We're going through a change of the climate of the climate. We're going from what I call later to now. So when I was growing up in Minnesota in the 50s, later was when I could clean that river, purify that lake, rescue that orangutan. I could do it now or I could do it later. Today, later is officially over. Later will be too late, so whatever you're going to save, please save it now. That is a climate change. We're going through a change in the climate of globalization. We're going from a world that was interconnected to a world that is interdependent. And in an interdependent world, you get a geoeconomic inversion. Your friends start to be able to kill you faster than your enemies. If Greek and Italian banks had gone under last night, Israel might have had to cancel, INS might have had to cancel this conference. Wait a minute, Greece, uh, Italy, they're, they're allies. They can kill you in an interdependent world. And in an interdependent world, your rival falling 
becomes more dangerous than your rival rising. If China had taken six more islands in the South China Sea last night, personally, I couldn't care less. I would have lost no sleep. Had China lost 6% growth last night, I would not have slept, and this conference would have been canceled. Your rival falling in an interdependent world becomes more dangerous than your rival rising. That is a climate change. And lastly, we're going through a change in the climate of technology and business. Every business today can sensorize, capture the data around its business, analyze that data, find the needle in the haystack of that data as the norm, not the exception, optimize off that data, prophesize off that data, customize off that data, localize off that data, and digitize new jobs, products, and services off that data. We're going through three climate changes at once. And what they are doing, you may have noticed, is blowing up every major political party in the industrial world. Have you noticed in the last six years? They're all blowing up. The Tories blew up. They became a Brexit party from a pro-business nationalist party. British Labor Party became a Marxist party. The liberals disappeared. The American Republican Party has become a cult of personality. The Democrats have blown up. They just don't know it. They'll find out if they get back in power. France today is the only country in the world ruled by a president with no party and an opposition with no leader. Ukraine and Italy both have comedians as presidents. Every, and I don't have to tell you what's going on here, the Likud has also become a cult of personality. The party that founded Israel Labor has almost disappeared, and the biggest party in the country didn't exist a year ago. Every major political party in the industrial world is blowing up. Why is that? Because all these parties actually emerged as responses to the last great energy release, the Industrial Revolution. And what their response was to get the most out of that revolution and contain the worst was that we'll build a set of walls and we'll build a set of floors. And politics will be about those walls and floors. People on the right will argue for lower walls and thinner floors, and people on the left will argue for higher walls and thicker walls, thicker floors. And politics became a very left-right binary grid around those choices. What happened as a result of my accelerations is that it completely blew up those choices because the world suddenly got fast, it got fused, and it got deep. It got fused by climate change, obviously fusing all of our climate realities. Now, you know, in the old days, if your country had bad weather and mine had good weather, I said too bad. Now I know that your weather and my weather are deeply intertwined and fused because of both of our behavior. You know, Israel discovered a few years ago that because the Palestinians did not have a wastewater treatment in Gaza, they were putting their garbage in the sea, it was floating up the prevailing current to Ashkelon, and all their poop was getting in Israel's desalination system, forcing Israel to have to close the desalination system on a regular basis to clean it out. We are now fused in a way we've never been before. The world is fast to a degree we've never been before. You know, in the old days, you educated here at Tel Aviv University, and I, as an employer, I employed. But now that, now that change is happening so fast, I can't wait for you to educate for me as an employer to have the skilled workers I need. You know, a few years ago, when Google released TensorFlow, which is the, marine, marine, the machine learning algorithm, Udacity, the online learning platform, had a course up on TensorFlow in 30 days. Did Tel Aviv University have a course up in TensorFlow in 30 days? Did Ohio State? No way. Three months ago, Google, or four months ago, Google released TensorFlow 2.0. Udacity had a course up the same day. So the old days where you educate, I employ, that's over. Now employers all over the world are having to go back into the education business because no one knows better the skills they need. Same with deep. You may have noticed we all suddenly started using the word deep. Deep fake, deep state, deep mind, deep research, deep medicine. No one declared it, but we all suddenly reached for a word deep because we intuited that technology now is going so deep can, can fake your face with a depth of precision. 
can hit your DNA and toggle it with a depth of precision like we have never seen before. And we're feeling it, you can feel it in the popular culture. I follow popular culture a lot. You may have noticed the song that won the Oscars last year by Lady Gaga was called Shallow. But what was the main verse? I'm off the deep end, watch as I dive in. I'll never see the ground crash to the surface where they can't hurt us. We're far from the shallow now. Oh, baby, we are far from the shallow now. So the old days where I innovate and the government regulates, that's so 1950s. The government can't catch me now. There were leaked emails from Boeing the other day in the New York Times. They were talking about, the Boeing engineers were talking about their FAA regulator. And one of them pointed out that their regulator was so behind Boeing's engineers that watching their FAA regulator was like watching a dog watching television. Okay? So suddenly, I as a regulator and you as an innovator have to be in multiple states at the same time. All across the board now, we're discovering that the old binary left-right thing doesn't work anymore. We have to be in multiple states at the same time. We have to move from a grid to an ecosystem way of governing ourselves. And when you have to move from a grid to an ecosystem, you have to start by asking, what is it you want as a country? You want two things. You want resilience, because you're dealing with all these climate changes, but you also want propulsion to move ahead. You want resilience and propulsion today when you're moving from a grid to an ecosystem. Well, as I thought about that, I thought, who do I call for advice on how you get resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? And then I realized I knew this woman. She was 3.8 billion years old. She dealt with more climate changes than anybody. Her name was Mother Nature. So I called her up, made an appointment, went out to see her. I said, Mother Nature, how do you produce resilience and propulsion when the climate changes? How do you produce ecosystem politics? She said, well, Tom, I have to tell you, everything I do, I do unconsciously, but these are my strategies. First of all, she said, I am incredibly adaptive. In my world, it's not the smartest who survive, not the strongest who survive, it's the most adaptive who survive. And I teach that lesson through a process I call natural selection. You may have heard of it. Secondly, she said, Tom, I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. In my world, in my world, wherever I see a blank space in nature, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Third, she said, I'm incredibly pluralistic. Oh, Tom, she said, I'm the most diverse person you've ever met. I try 20 different species of everything. I see who wins. And she told me something interesting. She told me she noticed her most diverse ecosystems are also her most resilient and propulsive ecosystems. I love diversity, she said. For she said, I'm incredibly hybrid and heterodox in my thinking. No, uh, you know, no ideological positions for me. I'm very flexible. I'll try any trees with any soils, any bees with any flowers. Nothing dogmatic about me. Fifth, she said, I'm a lifelong learner, and I turn all my new learning into DNA. Six, she said, I'm incredibly open source. I let anybody fork off and go in any direction that they like. Seven, she said, I notice my healthiest ecosystems are all healthy because they're built on networks, complex adaptive networks, whose networking massively increases their resilience and propulsion. And lastly, she said, Tom, I have to tell you, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures. I return them to the great manufacturer in the sky, and I take their energy to nourish my successes. What I am telling you today is the country, the community, the company that most mirrors Mother Nature's way of building resilience and propulsion when the climate changes is the one that will thrive in this age of acceleration. And every party is going to have to move from binary grid approach to ecosystem approach. And because that's very difficult and we're in the middle of the transition, the old party frameworks are collapsing, but the labels are staying the same. And to hold their base, they're all turning into cults of personality around strongmen. But the fundamental transition that is going to have to happen in this age of acceleration, and the countries, communities, and companies that make this transition from grid to ecosystem, 
is the one that will thrive in the age of acceleration. That's politics. What about geopolitics? So um, basically, to understand geopolitics today is to understand how these three accelerations are all affecting nation states. Now we all know that the world, and particularly this neighborhood, was governed for millennia by empires. The Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire. That's how we governed the world, through empires, basically. Until the 19th and 20th century, decolonization and uh, World War I and World War II, we actually broke up the world into, in 1945 at the UN, 192 nation states. We'd never had a world like that. And the 50 years after World War II, were a fantastic time to be a weak little state. If you were a weak little state, oh, that was your era. First of all, why? Because first of all, there were two superpowers out there, throwing money at you, building your dam, educating your kids at Patrice Lumumba University in Moscow or Ohio State in America, giving you foreign aid, giving you wheat. You could be Syria and lose three wars to Israel and get your army rebuilt for free all three times. It was, a, it was a good world for a weak, crummy little state. Number two, climate change was very moderate. Number three, populations were very low, relatively. Number four, no one had one of these to compare themselves to the villager country next door. And lastly, China was not in the World Trade Organization. So everybody could be in low-wage industries and the textile business. My argument is my three accelerations have completely flipped this world. Now, no superpower wants to touch you because all they win is a bill. What the Russians are doing in Syria is, is anomalous and they're not even spending that much money. Number two, populations have exploded. Iran was 40 million people in 1979. It's 82 million today. And Egypt probably added another million just in the last year and a half. Number three, climate change is now hammering these countries. I did a documentary about human trafficking from sub-Saharan Africa to Europe. We started in villages in northern Senegal. Villages in northern Senegal today are already at two degrees rise average temperature since the Industrial Revolution. Two degrees rise average temperature. Where have I heard that number? Oh, that's what the Paris Climate Agreement was designed to prevent by 2100. Senegal's already there. They're going to four degrees. Fourth, everybody now has one of these. And you know what it also has on it? It's got a human trafficking app to, for me to figure out just how to get out of this hellhole I'm living in. And lastly, China's in the World Trade Organization so nobody can be in the textile business. I was in Egypt for Tahrir Square, three weeks. I was away from my wife, my honey, for three weeks. When I got to go home, I went to Egypt Air Cairo Airport. I stopped in the Treasures of Egypt souvenir shop to buy my honey, something to remind her where her honey had been. Let's see, what do they have here? Pyramids, ashtrays. Oh, my honey doesn't smoke. Oh, what's over here? Sphinx bookends. Oh, my honey has a lot of bookends. What's this? It was a stuffed camel. And if you squeezed its hump, it honked. And my honey didn't have a honking humped camel. So I picked it up, turned it over, looked on the bottom, and what did it say? Made in China, yeah! You're the lowest wage country in the Eastern Mediterranean, and there's now a country half a world away can make your honking humped camel cheaper than you can ship it and make a profit. What all this is doing, you may have noticed, is now fracturing weak states, blowing up others, and they are hemorrhaging their people. And the states that are blowing up first are all those whose borders are straight lines because they are the most artificial. They 
correspond to no ethnic or geographic boundaries. And Israel is surrounded by it. So you got the off-Broadway version of this from Darfur, Eritrea, and South Sudan. We got the Broadway version from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and Europe got the Broadway, Broadway version from all of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. The biggest flow in the world today is now people trying to get out of the world of disorder into the world of order, and then fundamentally changing the politics of the world of order, creating all of these populist, nationalist backlashes. And so, to talk about Israel today is to talk about a country whose fundamental geopolitical challenge has changed. For its first 60 years of life, Israel's main geopolitical challenge was managing strength, its own strength and the strength of its neighbors. Israel's central geopolitical challenge going forward is going to be managing weakness, the weakness of all its neighbors and states falling apart all around you. The most important security threat facing Israel going forward in my age of three climate changes at once is not an invasion of an Arab army. It will be an invasion of an army of Arab and Muslim refugees. And managing, managing weakness, managing weakness is hell on wheels. It's one of the hardest things there is to do. So now you understand, maybe a little bit, what I was saying about Suleimani and why I insist we must fundamentally reframe how we think of people like him. Because in my view, what Suleimani wanted was us to judge him the old way, as a a revolutionary leader, the Iranian Che Guevara, always in the uniform, dashing, cameras following him, projecting Iran's power in the old way on an old battlefield. And what came out of me that day in New Zealand was something very different. I said, I'm going to judge you against the real challenge Iran faces today how to achieve resilience and propulsion in the age of accelerations. And by that metric, Mr. Suleimani, you are a bloody moron. You are a bloody moron. You look around at Iran today. Iran's biggest lake, second largest lake in the Middle East, Saline Lake, Lake Ramia, is 90% gone. 6,000 square miles gone. Water shortages are now all over Iran because of water mismanagement and climate change and too much damming. In fact, the big unrest in 2016 and 2017 there was all triggered by water shortages. Iran just was hit with extreme flooding the other day. Its population, as I say, has doubled. And the latest study from Tel Aviv University says by 2100, winter in this region is going to be shortened by two months. You can forget about November and you can forget about December. Those will no longer be raining months. In the face of that challenge, what did you do, Mr. Suleiman? Iran got a one-time massive injection of finance and capital through the Iran nuclear deal. And what did you do with that? You went off looking for dignity in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways. You completely squandered that windfall. You spent it hiring Arab Shiites to kill Arab Sunnis in Beirut, Damascus, Baghdad, and Sana'a. I can't think of anything more bloody stupid than that in the age of acceleration. You doubled down in a competition with Saudi Arabia over who will control Yemen. 
That's two bald men fighting over a comb. Two bald men fighting over a comb. What are you going to do if you win? So in conclusion, let me say this. I actually arrived in Beirut as the junior UPI reporter, my first foreign assignment in 1979. And the first two major stories I covered in 1979 on my little Adler typewriter. Kids, a typewriter was a device. If you pressed a key, it created pressure on a roller. On my little Adler typewriter was the Iranian Revolution and the takeover of the Grand Mosque in Mecca. Those were my first two stories. I didn't know it, but I was in Beirut, in the Middle East, for a giant right turn where Saudi Arabia, funded by more oil wealth than ever, took the Arab Sunni world on a, to a complete dead end through a spread of Wahhabism and Salafist Islam, and Iran took the Shia world on a parallel dead end through the spread of Shia Islam. It all started in 1979. I happened to be there. And that period, 1979 to 2019, was an era of massive squandering of the wealth and potential, human potential, of the Arab Muslim world, while the rest of the world was moving on. Well, what happened in the last six months? Isn't it interesting? Who got killed? Abu Bakr Baghdadi, the head of ISIS, and now Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force. In other words, the two men who represented the sort of climax of these two bad turns both got killed by America in the last six months. And I would argue that the death of Suleimani and the death of Abu Bakr Baghdadi mark the end of an era, peak Islamism. It's not going to disappear tomorrow at all, but I think we have just seen peak Islamism, peak jihadism, and an end of the Islamist fantasy that kicked off in 1979. To me, the question now is, which road will the Arab Muslim world go to post this moment? Because one road is called fauda, and the other road is called pluralism now. You see, in my view, the Arab region around Israel, they are too late for imperialism. So what we're seeing right now is authoritarianism competing with tribalism, competing, competing for the first time on the streets of Beirut and Baghdad with pluralism. Authentic cries by young Beirutis, Sunnis and Shia together in Baghdad and in Beirut that we want to go down a path of pluralism and not sectarianism. Pl pluralism is Mother Nature's way. It is an ecosystem approach. And in my view, the only thing that's going to save this neighborhood around Israel, and it hopefully one day enable you not to be always managing weakness, is if these countries find their way to gender pluralism, religious pluralism, education pluralism, and political pluralism. And that's what those kids on the streets of Beirut, Baghdad, Algiers, and other places are now demanding because they know that's the only way they're going to have resilience and propulsion in this age of acceleration. And they know one other thing, that that moron Suleimani had no idea. And that's that Mother Nature has no clue where the border is between Iran and Iraq. And Mother Nature also has no clue. In fact, she's never heard of Area A, Area B, or Area C in the West Bank. All Mother Nature knows is chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is, baby. She's just chemistry, biology, and physics. And as my teacher Rob Watson says, you can't talk her up. 
You can't talk her down. You can't say, Mother Nature, we're having our third election in a year. Can you lay off for a while? Bibi needs to outflank, you know, uh, his right. No, Mother Nature is going to do what chemistry, whatever chemistry, biology, physics dictate, and Mother Nature always bats last, and she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with Mother Nature. And that is exactly what everyone in this region is doing right now. You remember Princess Di said the problem with my marriage was that there were three people in my marriage? Well, there's now three people in your marriage. There's you and the Palestinians and Mother Nature. There's you and Iran and Mother Nature. There's now three people in your marriage, and she always bats last, and she always bats a thousand. The future, in my view, belongs to those who will live by her rules. They will be the ones with resilience and propulsion. And that's why I wrote that Qasem Soleimani was the dumbest man in Iran. And that's why my heart goes out to those kids on the streets of Beirut and Baghdad questing, questing for pluralism, because they know the hour is late, they know the other roads are all dead ends, and they know the most important truth of this age of acceleration. We have exactly enough time starting now. Thank you very much.